This is Radio Equalshock with your host, Alex Smith. Are you ready for back-to-back scorching heat waves? Probably not. New research from scientists at Princeton say heat waves are coming strong and closer together as the planet warms. Wherever you live, you are going to feel this. Our guest is the lead author of the new paper, Temporally Compound Heat Wave Events and Global Warming, an Emerging Hazard. Jane Wilson Baldwin is a postdoctoral research associate with the Princeton Environmental Institute in New Jersey. Jane Baldwin, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, it's good to have you here. Now, before we get to what is new, Jane, how do you define the term heat wave? So I think at its most basic, a heat wave is a period of consecutive, extremely hot days. There are a range of different definitions of heat waves. Some require, you know, at least three hot days in a row. Some require six hot days. But in general, you assign some threshold above which a day is considered extremely hot. And if you have a bunch of extremely hot days in a row, that's what's typically considered a heat wave. Now, on the topic of your new paper, the popular press talks about back-to-back heat waves. And Northern Europe experienced them in 2018. And multiple close-in-time heat waves hit the Mediterranean the year before that. So we're already getting the kind of events you studied? Yes, to some degree we are. One of the things we find in the paper, though, is that in the present, only about 10% of heat wave related risk comes from what we call compound heat waves, what the press has been calling back-to-back heat waves. But one of the key results of this paper is that we expect the proportion of heat wave risk that comes from these back-to-back heat waves will significantly increase with global warming. Your paper suggests extreme temperatures are, quote, among the most deadly of natural disasters. Can you quantify that for us, Jane? One study I can mention, there was an examination of heat wave-related or weather-related mortality in the United States, and it found that a plurality of weather-related mortality came from heat waves. So definitely other types of extreme weather events, you know, freezing rain or hurricanes can definitely have a sizable impact on mortality, and particularly if you have a hurricane uh, hitting the Gulf Coast one summer, then for that particular year, hurricane-related mortality might overwhelm weather-related mortality for that year. But on average, heat-related mortality causes about, I think the number is around 30% of weather-related risk in the U.S. Another caveat I should mention is that in places outside the U.S., that number might differ, but unfortunately, detailed mortality data and correspondence with extreme weather events is sometimes hard to come by. We did have one scientist on Radio EcoShock from Australia who said that heat deaths there had overtaken car deaths as the largest cause of sort of accidental deaths. But it's the sort of thing that sneaks up on you. I mean, we hear about four or even 20 people dying in a tornado, and that's a terrible thing. But the heat deaths, uh, you know, seniors and babies kind of drift into hospitals. They may pass away. We don't see the big headlines about it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one of the most insidious parts of heat waves is that often when a heat wave is occurring, if you read accounts of heat waves, the people living in a city won't even realize that it's killing, that that it's such a big risk until someone, I mean, the Chicago heat wave of 1995, famously, the guy who ran the morgue was the one who really said, hey, we have so many people going through the morgue so many more than usual, there must be something unusual going on. And that's when the city started to put out warnings about the heat wave. But the other thing that is problematic with heat waves is the people who tend to pass away are the elderly, the sick, the alone. They're they're populations that people sadly often aren't thinking about as much as others. Hurricanes, by contrast, you know, will sweep through an area and affect all sorts of different demographic groups more similarly, it seems. The environmental group We Act in Harlem, New York, says inner city residents are more vulnerable to recurring heat waves. Can you talk about that? That's a really 
interesting piece of work that was done recently. Um, we act developed a relationship with a bunch of community members in Harlem, and they were able to place sensors within individuals' apartments in a range of different types of apartment buildings, sometimes on upper floors, sometimes on lower floors, sometimes with fans, without fans, with some degree of AC, with no AC. And they tracked temperature within those apartments going in and out of heat waves. And what they found was that if you look at outdoor temperature around a heat wave in New York City, it will go up and then it will temperature will cool down pretty rapidly once the heat wave ends. But indoor temperature will remain elevated and lag outdoor temperature to some degree. So what that means is if you have two heat waves occurring close together with a cooler break in between, even though it might cool down quite a bit outside, residents inside apartments that aren't air conditioned well might not really see a break between those two heat waves. And this is actually in, in accounts of people uh, perishing during heat waves, often they're in their apartment and for whatever reason, they weren't able to open a window and they didn't have a family member to check on them. So sometimes the good thing about heat waves is interventions can be very simple to help deal with them. But again, um, the situations in which people often die can be uh, pretty tragic and just, you know, people that live around us that we're just not thinking about as much, perhaps. Now, that was surely the story in France in the 2003 heat wave that killed somewhere between 30 and 70,000 people in Europe. And there were a lot of seniors who were indoors, nobody to check on them. And uh, some inner city residents are afraid to open their windows because of crime. So you, you get all kinds of factors to work in that, that can kill people. Right, definitely. And I've also heard some discussion about sometimes different cultural differences. If people have maybe immigrated from somewhere in the tropics, they might think, well, you know, I, we never had AC down there. I'll be fine. Um, and you often see that kind of attitude more in um, also in more elderly populations. So there are all sorts of complex factors that might lead some people to be more vulnerable than others. Jane Baldwin, you have co-authored several papers on the urban heat island effect. What is that, and does that relate to the returning heat waves in your new paper? Yeah, so the urban heat island effect is that if we look at cities compared to surrounding rural areas, cities tend to have elevated temperatures compared to surrounding rural areas. There are a few different reasons for this. One reason is that the surface in cities tends to be drier than in surrounding rural areas, and so the city surface can't cool via evaporation, um, and that results in a, a hotter surface in cities. There are also other aspects that have to do with energy usage in cities and just insulation and wind flow in general and also the, the color of surfaces. Surfaces in cities tend to be dark, and um, much like if you have a black car that heats up faster than a white car, cities can, as a result, heat up more. So all these factors lead urban places to be hotter on average than surrounding rural places. Now, this is a significant concern, particularly in light of global warming, because we have a increase in temperature that's resulting from increasing carbon emissions, but we also have urban areas that, you know, there's a general trend across the world for people are increasingly moving to urban regions. Urban regions are getting denser and bigger, and as a result, you see a stronger and stronger urban heat island effect. So in the areas where more people are living, they're being struck by a double header of both global warming, increasing temperature, and the urban heat island effect becoming more exacerbated. In our paper, the climate model we were using, doesn't it doesn't differentiate urban versus rural places. So we didn't specifically look at how the urban heat island effect would um, influence our results. That's actually something, though, we're excited to do in future work, a collaborator who is now at Boston University but used to also be at Princeton, developed a module for the climate model I work with that allows you to differentiate these effects of urban versus more rural places. So that's an exciting future direction. Yeah, there's all sorts of science could come out of your paper. I mean, for example, we know air pollution is killing millions of people around the world already. And I don't know, did you get a chance in your new study to look at the combined effect of smog and back-to-back -back heat waves? No, that's that's an interesting idea. I haven't um, I haven't looked at that specifically. 
I know that there's a lot of research that looks at how heat waves and air pollution interact, but I haven't thought about it so much in terms of back-to-back heat waves and air pollution. We do see evidence of residual impacts of heat waves in many places. Studies of trees show they can still be in a heat protective and and less productive state as long as 11 days after a heat event. So what does your new science tell us about forest and maybe agricultural productivity when there's less chance to recover between one heat wave and the next? That's a very good question. That's an interesting fact you say about tree recovery from heat waves. I actually um, hadn't heard that specific statistic before. I'll send you a link to it. It's it's about studies in fir trees. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see that. That would be very helpful. So common models of uh, plant growth often divide temperatures between growing degree days, so temperatures at which plants can grow well, and killing degree days, so temperatures at which plant the temperature is too high or perhaps too low and the plant will start to die off. And an interesting question, um, which we've thought about exploring but haven't really had a chance to yet, would be, is there some kind of interaction between when you have multiple hot days in sequence that it's not just that the temperature on each day leads up to the the effects on the plants, if there's some kind of, we, we'd call it a nonlinearity, but an interaction between um the high temperatures on different days that could lead to elevated plant mortality. So in in short, we haven't specifically investigated this, but I would expect that there might be problematic interactions where if you have a heat wave early in a plant's growth cycle and then you're struck with another heat wave, the effects of those two might be greater than the sum of the parts of those two events, but we don't have concrete evidence of that yet. I think another avenue of investigation with recurring heat waves could be about the insects and other species like birds. They've got to be affected when they don't get time to recover from extreme heat. That's another avenue to look at. Yeah, yeah, that'd be very interesting. I'm not sure. So I've talked a fair amount with um, epidemiologists about how my work connects to human mortality. I haven't talked so much with uh, ecologists, but it would be interesting to know what kind of data they have and what kind of information about bird behavior during extremely hot events. That, that's an interesting idea. Thanks. <laughs> this is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith with my guest, Princeton scientist, Dr. Jane Baldwin. We're talking about the developing phenomenon of multiple heat waves hitting one after another, Let's get to your findings. Jane, please take as much time as you need to tell us. Have return heat waves increased in the last few decades? And what do models show happening in the future? I'm not sure the time series of the historical period that we have is long enough to really clearly indicate whether back-to-back heat waves have been increasing We do see some evidence of an increasing frequency of heat waves with climate change. And so at its most basic, you'd expect if you have more heat waves, then they'd be more likely to occur back to back. And so I think in general, that's the case. Now, where it becomes a little more complicated, and this is where a lot of the paper was focused, was when we look at projections of future climate uh, using using climate models, so what the world will be like with increasing carbon emissions, we find a much higher proportion of heat wave risk coming from these back-to-back heat waves, these kind of heat wave events that exhibit more complex temporal structures than just one period above extremely hot threshold. So given that we see this change, one question you can ask is, well, can the, this simply be explained by a increase in mean temperature on average temperatures? Or is there something in the climate system that's making heat waves kind of uh, group together more, stick closer to one another? And that could be related to some change in uh, variance, we'd say. And what we find, and this was actually surprising at first, though now, of course, it makes a lot more sense to us now, is that Essentially, all of the change in these compound heat waves and their pattern that we see with global warming and their increase can be quite simply explained by an increase in mean temperature. This 
change doesn't require complex changes in how temperature is varying over time. So essentially, if you take weather today and you think about moving up, a moving up its mean to higher values of temperature, then you start to see an increasing number of these compound heat waves and a greater percentage of heat wave risk coming from these compound heat waves. So our initial reaction to that was, well, that's not a super exciting result then. It's so obvious and you just increase mean temperature. But I think where this result is really important is when, A, since it's just rooted in the increase in mean temperature, uh, it makes it much more confident that it is a robust result. If it was rooted in some complex change in temperature variability, we'd have a lot less confidence that climate models would be able to project that. So one point is we're confident this is a robust result. The second point is if you look at how heat wave warning systems work today. So these are systems, you know, if you live in a city like New York, for example, if there are, say, two days above, I think it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the city government issues a notification to weather forecasters and um, other bodies in the area to put out warnings. So you turn on your TV, you're looking at the weather, and the guy would say, you know, there's a heat wave warning effect, you know, make sure to drink water, stay indoors, et cetera. So right now how these heat wave warning systems work is they look at the next few days of predicted temperature. And I think one of the key implications of this study is going into the future as we see more and more of these compound heat waves, I think it'll be increasingly important to not only consider the predicted weather, but also consider the recent past history of weather when one is deciding whether to issue a heat wave warning. Does that make sense? It does make sense. You also stimulated me to think that another factor has got to be the changes in the waviness of the jet stream and the fact that we have some weather systems stalling over certain areas and and, and some blocking happening. And so if it's really hot where you are, it may stay hot like that for quite a long time. This has happened in northern Australia. It's happened in California last year. And I think that could also be a factor driving recurring heat waves. So that, when I was talking about changes in the variance of temperature, the variability of temperature. If we were seeing more changes in blocking, a more blocking events, greater waviness of the jet stream, that would fall under the category of being a change in variance that was affecting heat waves. Interestingly, though, in the context of the climate model we used, um, we find that those changes in variance, which could be changes in blocking events, for example, frequency of blocking events, really aren't playing a very big role in this result. That's not to say they aren't playing some role, but they're really not a first-order important effect. Now, an important caveat to that is we were looking at one climate model, which we use because it has particularly high resolution in the atmosphere, meaning it has a lot of uh, spatial detail that's useful for looking at these types of extreme events. But it would be useful to see if this result holds up with uh, other climate models, for example. Along with your co-author, Gabriel Vecchi, you also specialize in the study of climate and Asian cyclones. We've had some terrible tropical cyclones in the past few years. Can we make any good predictions about what will happen with tropical cyclones as the world warms? Yeah, that's a million-dollar question. (laughs) Um, So I think there are some things that we have a fair amount of confidence on with regard to tropical cyclones, and there are some things we have somewhat less confidence on. So there are pretty robust projections that the intensity of tropical cyclones will increase with global warming. So you're seeing more Category 5, for example, hurricanes as opposed to Category 1 or 2, where I'm The categories are the Saffir-Simpson scale, which is a way of ranking hurricane intensity, how strong the winds are, et cetera. But the thing we're a lot less sure about is how the frequency of tropical cyclones will change with global warming. There's some evidence that we'll have, people say, we'll have fewer but fiercer, so meaning we'll have stronger but fewer tropical cyclones. But that result, actually, I'd say regarding the frequency is still very much under debate. I was actually part of a paper that's currently, it's not quite out, but it should be published soon, 
that was looking at changes in tropical cyclone frequency in a very high-resolution global climate model. And interestingly, it suggests, and this is a global climate model that can simulate tropical cyclones up to Category 5, which is previously climate models were not capable of doing. In the context of that model, we actually don't see a decrease in frequency of tropical cyclones. Um, we see about the same or a slight increase in frequency and an increase in strength of tropical cyclones, which is all to say that I don't think the right takeaway is that frequency of tropical cyclones is definitely going to increase, but I think there's still a lot of uncertainty regarding how the frequency of tropical cyclones will change. I think this is an important challenge to try to understand this question better for uh, adaptation to our changing climate. Thanks for that insight. Well, returning to your new paper on repeating heat waves, my quick research into this topic suggests the first heat wave of the season is the most dangerous. It kills people, especially seniors who seem to be slow to adapt. But I wonder if that'll continue to be true when we get multiple heat waves. Maybe that's going to be the real danger as as the world warms. Yeah, so you're hitting on the question that's currently (laughs) causing me headaches. So I've recently been trying to follow up on my paper, which the paper that was recently published focused primarily on the physical hazard of heat waves, meaning we were looking at temperature. We didn't actually look at mortality data very quantitatively. We looked at some past historical heat waves and how much mortality they caused, but we didn't directly try to relate compound heat wave events in a very rigorous quantitative fashion to um, mortality. And there are actually pretty complex effects that heat waves have on mortality for the following reasons. So there's a population of people that tends to be most susceptible to perishing during heat waves, as we discussed, the old, the sick, um, individuals who live alone. And what seems to happen during extremely hot days is there'll be a spike in mortality on that extremely hot day. So more people are dying due to the extremely hot weather. But then sometimes in the days following, you actually see a decrease in mortality. And so what that suggests is that there's some finite pool of people that are really at risk for heat waves. And it's possible that if they perish in an initial heat wave because they wouldn't be around anymore, then you might actually see decreased mortality to a subsequent heat wave. In the converse, it's also possible that you have an initial heat wave And that kind of heats up buildings and overwhelms emergency systems such that a subsequent heat wave would have greater effects. So that's the current question I'm actually grappling with is trying to understand, do we expect the impacts of these compound heat waves to add linearly or do we expect two heat waves occurring in sequence, the second one to have greater impacts than the first one or the second one to have reduce impacts compared to the first one because of this kind of displaced mortality effect. So the result you were talking about where heat waves early in the season seem to have the biggest impact. There's debate about what the reason, the mechanisms behind that result is. One possibility is that people do adapt. Another possibility is that we're seeing some of this mortality displacement effect. So it's intellectually interesting, but it's troubling how much uh, there's still... There's definitely still a lot to understand about how temperature impacts mortality. And the field is making a lot of progress in this direction right now. It's evolved a ton since, say, 2008 when temperature and mortality was just not a field that was studied very closely. But I think there's still a lot to learn. Yeah, in the 1900s, people didn't even write down if people were killed by heat. They just put down heart attack or stroke or something. So... Uh, Here's a question that I ask most of my scientists towards the end of the interview, and it's how are you concerned personally with climate change, and does what you know sometimes bother you? Yes, I am concerned personally with climate change. So I got involved in this field in sort of an unusual way. Most people who end up being atmospheric scientists, I found, have physics or math backgrounds. I actually started out studying environmental policy in college, and I was pretty involved in some advocacy for Massachusetts to have uh, cleaner electricity. But as I was involved in that advocacy, I realized that I'm the kind of person that uh, if you ask me a question about, say, how tropical cyclones are going to change, I tend to get very mired in the whys and the details uh, in answer to the question. So that led me to become a scientist. But Um, trying to 
do something constructive to help people adapt to this issue we're facing is something that's definitely at the top of my mind when I'm doing my research. Um, I think there are some scientists that would say, oh, well, you need to be careful not to be too much of a do-gooder, you know, that could make the work that you're doing biased in some way. But but I think it's possible to both. I, a lot of the work I do is rooted in just intellectual curiosity. I've done some work on uh, the influence of mountains on hurricanes, for example, and we did that because we just thought it was an interesting question, important for basic understanding of the climate system. But then the heat waves paper, for example, I, I started working on it because I was concerned that this was a risk that was not understood very well in the face of a changing climate. In terms of personal actions, I try to eat mostly vegetarian now, but I have some food intolerances, so sometimes I need to supplement my diet with meat. Um, I always try and find ways to drive less, but that's a bit of a challenge living in suburban New Jersey. But hopefully, always trying to do better in that regard, never perfect. (laughs) That's my life entirely. We're trying to do better, but never perfect. And I have to speak up for doing good. I think we should just uh, keep on aiming for that. We have been speaking with Jane Wilson Baldwin from the Princeton Environmental Institute. You can find links to the paper that we've been talking about in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Jane, thank you so much for sharing with us on Radio EcoShock. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great.